me just to check that. Okay. Um, so I'm a PhD student at the Financial Computing CDT at UCL. Um, I'm in my uh, third year now. Uh, I've been working on um, the emergence of market manipulation in trading agents, uh, if they're uh, trained through reinforcement learning, uh, and then methods to stop that from happening. And that's taken me on a, on a journey into um, legal definitions of uh, intent, what intent means for an algorithm, uh, which is Greenfield. Um, so uh, a bit of a digression there in the past year, but now I'm starting to come back to, um, uh, to think more about uh, uh, trading strategies and agents and things. Prior to being a, a PhD student, uh, I worked in uh, a hedge fund for 10 years uh, in a variety of roles as risk manager, um, portfolio manager, FT analyst. Uh, and that was in emerging market equities. And prior to that, uh, I studied uh, for an MPhil in economics uh, from Oxford. And then going back even further in time, I originally did an undergrad in, in mathematics at Warwick. So uh, the topic of the presentation today uh, is uh, causal Goodhart, uh, refers to Goodhart's law and reinforcement learning. So, okay, so firstly, I'll explain the origin of this paper. Um, it, um, it started, uh, well, from Judea Pearl, actually. Um, he made a couple of observations in his book of why, which I, I read over the winter. Uh, recently, he, uh, he tweeted this. Beware a model blind system might conclude that the rooster crow explains the sunrise. Um, so after reading his book, I became interested in how vulnerable reinforcement learning methods are to cognitive causal errors. Um, so model free reinforcement learning is the type that has received considerable success and press attention of late and much excitement in uh, applying it to financial applications such as trading. So in its strictest form, the learner does not know the dynamics of the system that it explores and does not attempt to learn a model of the system. Instead, it just learns through uh, myopic exploration techniques. Um, and more generally, I've been uh, studying reinforcement learning uh, applied to trading uh, and, and finding out about some of the shortcomings the method has. Um, so in Pearl's book, he talks about a ladder of causation. Um, and that reflects the complexity of thinking and reasoning required for certain problems invo involving causality. So level one problems uh, only require reasoning about correlations, um, how these variables are related. So the questions you can ask at uh, level one of the ladder are, if I saw this value of x, what would my belief of the value of y be? Level two corresponds to experimentation or what Pearl calls interventions. Um, so if I change X to this value, what would the value of Y be? And these questions are of particular importance uh, when you're thinking of any kind of uh, policy, for making decisions, uh, and that goes from, from government use to, to kind of trading use. And then finally, level three, which is highest, highest level of complexity for problems, uh, and that corresponds to counterfactual reasoning. Uh, it involves imagining things. So what would the value of Y be if X had not been the value that it did take, but was this instead? Um, so if the patient did not have COVID, what would they, uh, would they have died anyway? Um, this, this is an example of a counterfactual question. And these questions are quite important when we're considering evidential settings like courts where you need to establish uh, the cause of events. Sorry. Um, Um, so it's important to where we observe data generated under a policy and we want to reuse that data to reason about its distribution under a different policy regime uh, because there's certain situations when we can't do uh, experiments um, either for cost or, or for moral reasons uh, and that tends to be in, in the medical area. Um, so implications of the ladder of causality um, so a major theme in Pearl's work is that causality cannot be described by statistical ideas alone, such as correlation. Uh, so he gives an example um, 
the linear, linear regression y equals ax plus b. Uh, the equality sign is reflexive, so the statement is equivalent to saying ax plus b equals y. So changing a, uh, x must necessarily change y, uh, but then changing y must change x. Uh, but this could lead to kind of nonsensical situations. So for example, uh, it's been shown that children born between September and December perform academically better. So if you want uh, uh, your, uh, your nation's children to perform better, you could uh, mandate that every child should be born between September and December. Uh, and obviously that would be a, a nonsensical um, policy to take. So Pearl's view of causality is that it's a physical phenomena that exists outside statistics. And the history of causation, causality is very interesting and UCL doesn't have a very uh, illustrious part to play. Um, with uh, Carl Pearson, uh, uh, who was the first head of the eugenics department at UCL here. He denied categorically the existence of, of causality and then Ronald Fisher as well had um, some uh, some problems with uh, with with causality as well. So, if you believe Pearl, um, then you would conclude that AI can't approach um, the level of intelligence that humans have unless level two and level three capabilities are achieved. So, level two is dealing with interventions well, and level three is dealing dealing with counterfactuals well. So, you would think that reinforcement learning is definitely tied to causality. Uh, in reinforcement learning, um, you have an agent who acts, uh, the world changes as a result, and then they receive a, a reward. So, X are zero times. Um, but there's a, a bit of a paradox here because reinforcement learning demonstrably works. So either causality isn't that important uh, and, and Pearl is wrong, or maybe uh, perhaps reinforcement learning deals with causality in some mysterious way, perhaps in the, in the deep neural networks. It's done for us free, for free. Or perhaps the canonical examples of reinforcement learning uh, where we've been shown how well it performs in, in go, go, uh, games like Go and chess. Perhaps the causal structure in those, those games is unambiguous and there's not much room for making causal errors. Um, or maybe a third possibility is that uh, in AI research, sorry, in AI research, um, when something goes wrong, we don't have the vocabulary or desire to study the error or we don't uh, publicize the error particularly well. Uh, and this is uh, unlike economics and psychology where uh, there is a whole whole area area of research in, in both these subjects dedicated to looking at errors, cognitive and policy errors. Um, which brings us to Goodhart's law. So this was originally stated um, by Charles Goodhart um, in the 1970, in 1975 uh, in relation to monetary policy in the UK. He said that any observed regularity uh, will tend to collapse when pressure is placed uh, upon it for control purposes. It was rephrased in 1997 uh, by Marilyn Strathern and gained uh, a bit more um, recognition. She said, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And then uh, most recently, Mannheim and Garibrandt 2018 rephrased it as when optimization causes a collapse of the statistical relationship between a goal which the optimizer intends and the proxy used for that goal. Um, so it's been observed if you if you look at the Financial Times search for uh, Goodhart's law you'll see a comment about the government this year's response to COVID. Um, uh, they say that it's an example of uh, Goodhart's law, the desire to protect the NHS in the spring um, led, uh, led it to freeing up beds uh, by sending elderly into care homes uh, and that actually kind of created more deaths than, uh, uh, than not doing it. So that was an example this year of, of, of Goodhart's law perhaps. And the effect is related to uh, Lucas critique and Campbell's law, uh, which we'll just quickly go through. So Donald Campbell, 
identified this effect around the same same time as Goodhart. Uh, so my paper is called Campbell Goodhart. Um, Campbell's law is perhaps slightly less well known. Uh, he stated that the more any quantitative social the more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision making, the more subject will be to corruption pressures and the more apt it will be to distort and corrupt the social processes it is intended to monitor. Specifically on the subject of school examinations, he wrote, uh, when test scores become the goal of the teaching process, they both lose their values as indicators of educational um, uh, of educational status and distort the edu educational process in undesirable ways. And similar is the Lucas critique. So Robert Lucas is an economist. Uh, he made a, a critique of uh, a classical microeconomic theory again in, in around the mid 1970s. He said that given that the structure of an economic uh, econometric model consists of optimal decision rules of eco uh, economic agents and that optimal decision rules vary systematically with changes in the structure of series relevant to the decision maker. It follows that any change in policy will systematically alter the structure of the econometric models. So this is a strong argument for, di for using digital twins when considering the impact of, of policy uh, when you know uh, the impact is, is, is going to be determined by people's reaction to that policy. Uh, and that's a subject related to my research on uh, reinforcement learning agents learning to spoof uh, in um, trading environments populated by other intelligent trading agents. Final digression, which is related to Goodhart as well, is something called the Cobra effect. Uh, it was coined by Horse, C Horse Siebert in 2001. It refers to situations where policy brings about some change in the causal structure of the environment. Um, so strangely, Lots of examples of the Cobra effect uh, refer to pest reduction. Um, the, uh, the first example was in Colonial Delhi. Uh, the governor was alarmed by the number of uh, cobras. The cobra is a, a poisonous snake. So he offered a, um, a bounty on every snake that was captured. And the enterprising locals then duly started breeding snakes uh, so that they could collect more bounty. The governor realized uh, the problem stopped the bounty. Uh, the locals reduced uh, released the uh, now worthless snakes uh, and the net result was that um, there were more uh, snakes, cobras in the Delhi vicinity than ever, than, than ever. And there's a similar example with Hanoi uh, which consists of rats. Uh, the government wanted to get rid of rats uh, and the locals started breeding the rats to collect the bounty. Um, the, thing, the thing that draws these together is that um, uh, Mannheim Garabrandt, uh, which is a paper from 2018, they deconstruct uh, possible reasons why Goodhart's law happens uh, and they come up with the taxonomy uh, and the Cobra effect and um, Campbell's law appear in, in some of this taxon taxonomy. So some of the reasons why Goodhart's law appears, um, uh, there's a thing called extremal Goodhart, so that concerns the statistical relationship breaking down between indicator variable and, and policy variable. So extreme, var extreme values where you might optimize the, the kind of, perhaps if there was a linear um, relationship at medium uh, levels, the, that relationship breaks down at higher levels. Um, adversarial good heart concerns situations where parties respond to pol policies adversarially. So those are the examples of the Cobra effect and Campbell's law, which we just through, went through and also Lucas critique as well. And then pertinently for us and for uh, this paper today, uh, they identify a category of problem called causal good heart. So just before I talk about causal good heart, just a quick refresh from causal Bayesian networks. Um, they are essentially the same as, uh, as Bayesian networks. They are um, directed acyclical, acyclical graphs, uh, but this time the arrows describe a causality relationship between parent and child, um, where causality is taken to mean holding all other variables constant, a change in the parent will bring about a change in the child. Um, luckily, the independent structure, which a, a Bayesian network describes through its directed arrows is also described in the same way in a, in a causal diagram. So we can think about them roughly similar. The advantage of uh, the causal interpretation is they allow us to do uh, something that Pearl calls the do calculus. So we're able to um, manipulate, um, we're able to manipulate the graph uh, 
uh, when we do interventions. So when we set certain variables of the graph to certain, certain levels, the effect of doing an intervention is to delete all the parental arcs that go into a node. Uh, and then we just assign point mass to the, um, to the interventional variable. Uh, and then we, uh, we produce a subgraph. So we can see that more easily in this slide. Uh, so the gray variables, uh, so these diagrams on the right, they show um, goals, metrics, and, and uh, the gray variables are, are things where we might intervene on. Um, so when we intervene, we delete parental arcs. So in these two exam ex examples here, when we intervene on, on the gray variable, we, um, we delete the relationship, or we, we change the relationship between metric and goal. Um, and the particular example I'm going to talk about today is metric manipulation. So the example is uh, when my barometer shows high pressure, it's often sunny. So if I change my barometer to read high pressure, it will be sunny. So that's a, um, a simple uh, a causal good heart error that can. Be made um, about hospitals uh, uh, mechanisms mechanisms which go on there. So in my experiment, uh, uh, which I've called dog barometer, uh, I've um, I wanted to test to see whether a naive implementation of reinforcement learning would end up making a causal good heart type error. So the setting is there is a dog living in Scotland that wants to go for a walk. Um, The weather in Scotland is only sun or rain. The barometric pressure is high or low. High pressure predicts sun next period quite well and low pressure predicts rain quite well. Pressure is autocorrelated and depends on nothing else. Uh, if it's raining, the dog prefers to wear a coat, but if it's sunny, uh, he doesn't like wearing his coat. Um, the barometer is quite accurate. Uh, it has a button which sets the readings to high next period. And the dog has the dog can choose between waiting, pressing the barometer, leaving with a coat, or leaving without a coat. Uh, if it leaves, uh, the weather next period is revealed and the game ends. Uh, on the right, we've got the causal diagram which describes the situation uh, with um, the variables of the actions, uh, the barometer readings, uh, the pressure, and the weather. So the pressure variables, which are in red here on the diagram, are typically hidden from the dog. So he, he, will, he, want, he wants to use the barometer as a signal of, of what the pressure is going to be. So as a standard practice in reinforcement learning, I model it as a, a, an MDP, a Markov decision process, even though it's not. It should actually be a partially observable MDP. The states that the dog gets to see are the weather state and the barometer state. All the states are binary in the model. Um, I'll also allow, um, as, a, as a sanity check uh, in, uh, in some experiments for the dog to see the pressure, just to see that it recovers its uh, optimal uh, policy. Make sure that the learning algorithm does what it, it should do. The actions that the dog can do are waiting, pressing the barometer, exiting, exiting with a coat and exiting without a coat. The reward, reward matrix is such that the dog is rewarded the most when he can go outside in the sunshine without a coat. He likes walking in the rain with a coat a bit less, and most importantly, he really hates uh, being dressed inappropriately for the weather. So either wearing a coat in the sun or no coat in the rain. Um, here are the transition probabilities for the experiment. Uh, initially, I just assumed that the pressure has no particular predictive power for pressure next period. Uh, and that is the row parameter here. So that's just set to 0.5. Um, the barometer is an accuracy of 0.9, uh, but the barometer is always high when it has been pressed in the previous period. Um, and the weather behaves according to pressure value with probability equal to uh, 0.9. So I tested two different reinforcement learning methods. Um, firstly, I coded up the dog barometer environment in a way that is compatible with PyGym, which is a standard um, interface that you use for reinforcement learning. 
This allowed me to use a package called Stable Baselines, um, and that implements deep reinforcement learning algorithms. Having spent many, many hours in the past diligently coding up my own versions of these algorithms, I found this package I'd like to use and a huge time saver. But more importantly, it allowed me not to fall into the first cardinal sin of computing research, which is to program something and something myself when it's been done far better by someone else. Uh, and that other implementation has been tested more thoroughly than anything that I could ever possibly do. So that avoids any kind of um, stupid, to uh, stupid coding errors that I might make. Uh, stable baselines only initially available for TensorFlow, but it's been ported to PyTorch, which makes things a bit easier. Um, um, just in terms of uh, getting CUDA to um, set up with your, your GPU. I was able to use two methods uh, in stable baselines, DQN and A2C. Um, and that was just, uh, just because the action space and the, and, the, and the state space I have is, is discrete. So both of these methods are deep in the sense that they use neural networks to approximate um, various things. Uh, in the case of DQN, uh, the action value function is approximated by a neural network and in ATC, um, the value and the policy function are approximated by neural networks. Most interestingly, DQN is off policy learning method and ATC is an on policy learning method, which becomes important later on. I didn't bother changing any of the standard parameters. Um, so the neural networks used to estimate things uh, were two layer 64 neuron uh, feed forward networks uh, with um, hyperbolic tan activation functions. Um, given the size of this uh, little problem, uh, these neural networks are way too large, unnecessarily large, um, and actually, actual fact, kind of deep learning approaches are necessary to solve these problems. A tabular approach would have, would have worked just as well. So um, the experimental results. In the first experiment, um, where pressure doesn't have any kind of uh, pressure for this period doesn't have any uh, predictive power for next period. Um, in just a, as a sanity check, in the, in the case when pressure is visible, uh, both learning methods find an optimal strategy. Uh, I've called the optimal strategy pi and w, which is wait for the pressure to be high, then go out without a coat. Um, A2C would converge to a slightly worse strategy, which is the kind of um, the intuitive one is of, of wearing a coat or not wearing a coat, depending on whether the pressure is high or low. Um, but when we hide the pressure variable, uh, so the dog is only able to, to look at the barometer, uh, the performance of the two learning uh, methods diverges. So the pi NW strategy now is slightly different. I haven't relabeled re it just for brevity, but that now corresponds to using the barometer reading instead of the pressure reading, since the pressure can't be seen. Um, so ATC, A2C finds the optimal strategy all of the time. And the optimal strategy is to, um, uh, it's to um, wait for the barometer to, to, to read high and then go out without a coat. Um, but the DQN strategy makes the, the, the cause of good heart error, which is to press the barometer if, if, if the barometer shows a low reading and then go out without a coat when the barometer then shows a high. So the result is interesting in that it shows that one method is potentially more robust to the causally naive approach uh, than the other. So the second experiment, very similar. This time, pressure has some predictive power. So 0.75, um, if pressure is high uh, this period, then there's 0.75 chance that it'll be high next period. Uh, once again, in the situations where the pressure value is, is, is not hidden to the dog, the dog successfully uses the pressure value to, to tell what, what kind of weather and, and what color coat it should choose. Um, when it's hidden, as before, A2C finds the, the optimal strategy. Um, and uh, as before, DQN finds the, the stupid strategy. Um, 
this time because because of the correlation of pressure the weather the weather variable becomes quite becomes useful um, because it can be used to you know, infer the pressure of the uh, of the previous period and then that could be used to, to work out the, the pressure of, of the current period um, so it's the same result as again in the A2C uh, does the thing which is rational and, and um, DQN does the, the irrational strategy. Um, so an explanation of this could be in the way that DQN learns. So the way that DQN learns is that experiences are saved in, in one big memory bank and then batches a, a sample to update the neural network, um, which updates the value action network that the algorithm uses. So the experience that the um, that's saved does not encode the trajectories of behavior. Um, since the world was assumed to be Markovian right at the beginning, um, histories of, of actions aren't recorded. Um, so the occasions when the barometer has been pressed by the dog uh, can't be separated when um, from the occasions when the barometer hasn't been pressed and it is legitimately reading a, a higher or, or low level. So connected with this is the fact that DQN is an off policy uh, learning method. So by off policy, we mean that it's learning a policy without actually adopting that policy at the time that it's learning. Um, so off policy learning methods in, in reinforcement learning directly try to estimate the value of a particular state according to the optimal strategy. If the optimal value fun function is then found, a simple greedy strat strategy is the optimal strategy derived from the optimal value function. Um, so in off policy learning, rewards are never actually uh, derived from uh, kind of complete the assessment of complete strategies. Um, so the learning method never actually realizes in that pressing the barometer is, a, is a, a pointless thing to do. So I guess the question would be, why are we interested in off policy learning at all, given that this experiment shows that it's not very robust to, to causal misspecification? Why would we ever do off policy learning methods? Um, they are really important to, to policymakers uh, because most of the time we only have data generated under different policies. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, it might not be uh, kind of uh, financially feasible uh, to, to test new policies or it might not be ethically reasonable to test new policies. So a lot of the time we have to learn um, optimal policies from, from data generated under a different policy. So in that situation, uh, we need to go to uh, rung three of Pearl's causality ladder. Uh, so counterfactual reasoning. So the question there would be, given that this policy generated this data, what would its distribution be like if a different policy was used? Um, just on A2C, it's a on-policy uh, learning method. Um, so any time um, a single policy is being considered and the value function for that policy is being considered. Um, and so the stream of rewards uh, received under any particular policy does reflect the, the causal nature of the problem. Um, so this, I think, is why on-policy learning method doesn't get confused in the same way the off-policy off method does. Uh, it realizes that pressing the, the barometer policies where the barometer is pressed um, don't end up well. They don't pr produce a good, a good uh, final reward. And so they're able to discount that. So I guess an initial um, uh, conclusion from this little uh, uh, toy model is that um, on policy learning does seem to be more robust to um, kind of uh, situations where there might be um, some interesting causality dynamics going on. The problem is that we can only use on policy learning uh, when the cost of learning is very small um, and we can generate lots of data from experience. And that's only possible when we have a, a realistic simulator of the world where we can learn. Um, and 
these are the areas where reinforcement learning has um, has exceeded human performance. So things like chess and go, where we have a, a simulator which is 100% accurate uh, and it's free to simulate and create lots of data. So um, in those situations, it seems like on policy learning is uh, is is a better option. Um, I was wondering. whether uh, the whole experiment is guilty of somewhat of being a, a straw man, straw man argument. Um, given uh, we're deliberately using reinforcement learning in a, in a naive uh, kind of way, I guess it's a valid question to ask whether it's a straw man argument to show that machine learning is dumb, uh, given that's one of the initial assertions. Um, we can make any number of solutions uh, within conventional uh, reinforcement learning techniques um, to cure the problems, I think. Um, we could model it as a, a PO MDP, uh, so potentially a uh, partially observable MDP. Uh, we could use neural networks with memory. We could increase the state space to in include past actions. Uh, we could turn it into um, a model-based reinforcement learning uh, regime where the dog learns a model of the world and then learns a policy from that model. And also um, the issues which I highlighted with off sampling or with off policy sampling, there are lots of um, uh, techniques to, to kind of alleviate the biases which off policy sampling causes. Uh, I think my response is that any model of a real world problem will have some level of misspecification. Uh, not least the presence of hidden variables, which are, are going to plague almost every problem that you consider. Um, and this experiment is really just a demonstration of things of how things that can how things can go wrong uh, when you're modelling loosely and, and naively, and putting too much confidence in uh, 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 the techniques. But also, by using a very simple toy toy model. Uh, we're able to understand um, why a dumb policy might emerge. And um, we've actually defended reinforcement learning because of in spite of all the um, kind of misspecification and, and naive modeling approaches that, we, that we've, we've taken in this toy model, um, the A2, A2C method did actually find the optimal strategy. Um, so I guess it's a bit of a draw, the end result. Uh, but I think it's instructive uh, for us to um, just kind of reflect about the limitations of, of reinforcement learning without a specific model of causality. So in conclusion, uh, we found the on policy methods were um, more robust to causal misspecification. So if you have a, if you have a, um, a choice, um, then on policy methods, on policy learning methods are going to be uh, potentially more robust, but you might not always have a choice. Um, I think it shows that the performance of model re uh, model free reinforcement learning. So in the absence of a, a causal model, um, the outcome is slightly unpredictable. Uh, you might get an optimal strategy or you might end up with a very dumb strategy. Um, if the genesis of neural networks is the human brain, um, it's a badge of honor that um, neural networks also make the same kind of cognitive errors that humans make. Uh, and given that um, there are lots of examples of humans making good heart errors, causal good heart errors, uh, it shouldn't really come as much of a surprise that AI will also make the same type of error. Um, it should just make us aware that AI is very capable of, of making these of, of these causal mistakes. So we shouldn't put too much uh, uh, confidence in an AI derived policy. And it's made me think about extensions to this work. Uh, it'd be interesting to see whether other well-documented human biases, uh, and there's a whole literature in psychology and experimental economics on biases that exist and are, um, uh, exploited. Uh, it would be interesting to see if they uh, manifest in AI as well.
um, and kind of start developing a proper taxonomy of, of, of cognitive errors that appear in AI and linking that to the existing literature which appears in psychology. So that just about uh, uh, is the end of the presentation. I think I'm